Thank you for joining us in an exploration of how to support your child and teen clients via telehealth. This is for EMDR trained clinicians in response to the COVID-19 global pandemic. Hi, I'm Jackie Flynn. I'm an EMDRIA approved consultant and a registered play therapist and the host of Play Therapy Community Podcast. All right, let's just jump right in. This training is in response to the COVID-19 global pandemic and is intended for the mental health clinicians that work with children and teens and have completed the MDR basic training part one and part two. Definitely visit www.emdria.org for current information as well as training and consultation options. There are so many resources on that website and I really recommend looking at it often. It can um, really kind of provide some guidance when you feel lost and discombobulated. They have a lot of great things in there. Okay, so this is something that I found on that website that a lot of us here lately have been looking to for guidance during this transition to online therapy, telehealth, telemedicine. There's so many different terms for it these days. But this report has a lot of great information that at the time of this recording, it had recently came out. So it really highlights that there are some things that need to be explored further. There are some risk. Uh, it goes into detail of the different areas. They've been looking at this already before this pandem pandemic happened. So I'm going to share with you some of the things that I got from this report and um, th some things from my work. But I really recommend that you look at this report um, firsthand and I will link to it below so that you can just go right to it and um, if you can't find it through the link that I provide if that link um, doesn't work for some reason then go to www.emdria.org and just put it in the search it's the guidelines for virtual EMDR therapy again I'm Jackie Flynn I'm an EMDR IA approved consultant, MG approved consultant, and I'm a registered play therapist, and I'm also the founder of EMDR and play therapy integration support. All right, so I included a quote from Dr. Jen. She has been super inspirational to me and my work, so I feel like this is really um, pertinent during this time to remember that when we're working with children and adolescents in this time of uncertainty and we see lots of behaviors or symptoms that may look like they're regressing or maybe even getting worse over time, we need to remember the foundation of just attachment-seeking behaviors. So she says attachment-seeking behaviors are often a child's need for co-regulation. The body and the brain's way of communicating these needs demonstrates the importance of an embodied bottom-up approach to playful therapeutic interventions. So we're going to talk about some bottom-up approaches as well as top-up as well. And we're going to look at the difference between the two. But it is important to keep that in mind and be very intentional in our work. All right, so there's two parts to this webinar. The considerations and techniques to support our child and teen clients. What is one of the things that we need to keep at the forefront of our work is the therapeutic presence, just really being with the clients. Now, in the world of play therapy, this kind of takes me back to my grad school days in one of my very first classes when I heard about Gary Landreth's um, just really talking to us about the importance of the relationship. And when we keep that at just the, uh, the basis of what we're doing, it can help our clients feel safe and secure cure and a lot of healing can occur just with that therapeutic presence alone. So let's look at specifically in this online world of telehealth, some people call it teleplay or even online play therapy 
online EMDR therapy. Some people use the terms remotely, virtually, lots of different terms to describe working with our clients through virtual means. So we're going to talk about technical considerations, just have, how do we offer that therapeutic presence through attunement online? What are some of the risks that we really need to consider as EMDR clinicians in terms of ab reactions, dissociation, and safety? Uh, we need to be really intentional, and how we can do that is be really knowledgeable about the eight phases of EMDR therapy. Also, we need to consider the importance of taking extra time, extra efforts in making a therapeutic space really safe and secure and confidential. We need to prepare for the sessions in a way that really helps us to be most effective. We need to, um, not only for us, but for our clients, have any supportive play and art materials that may help our work and that is available to us. It will vary with our clients what there is available, so we need to be flexible. Parent and caregiver support is going to be talked about in this webinar, just how to consult with the parents during this time, and how to support our clients in between sessions, and just the importance of being aware of cultural and environmental considerations. Now, after looking at this list, this list isn't necessarily just specific to online therapy. This list applies to, uh, much of it applies to our work in the office when we're face to face in person with our clients. So when we're working online though we really want to plan for any technical issues. So you want to have your your charger just readily available next to you. You do want to ask your client how charged their device is or their computer, their laptop, whatever it is that they're working on. And if possible, you may want to hardwire the internet connection right to um, the wall rather than depending on an hot, a hotspot or Bluetooth. We will always want to keep as strong a connection as possible and know that some of it is unpredictable. So that's one thing that we need to really kind of be clear about is we can make all of the preparations and plans in the world and some things can happen that we didn't plan for. So we need to plan as much as possible um, so that when those things that we didn't plan for come up that we have as much tolerance and kind of resources as possible. All right, how do we nurture that therapeutic relationship through attunement online? There are a lot of playful ways to just truly connect with our clients. Now, if you're a child and teen cl uh, um, clinician already, you know that children, really any age, need to feel safe and secure before you can get any of the good work done, right? So online, you can, here you can see that we are doing the heart symbol. We have little rituals of connection. I pulled that from my training in Gottman Method Couples Therapy. It talks about the importance of kind of um, having things that you do over time that are predictable and familiar. So that's like a little heart symbol. There may be... Um, things that your client um, wants to show you and taking that time out to show that, hey, you really care, like, oh, show me your toys, or, oh, is that your dog back there, or whatever they want to show you, letting them lead. Nurturing that therapeutic relationship online is definitely possible, but it looks a little bit different. Also, creating a therapeutic space with considerations to safety, security, and confidentiality with keeping HIPAA compliance um, at the forefront of your work. Always making intentional efforts to maintain confidentiality on every level. So if you're working from home, that means having um, headphones on, a sound machine, locking the door so you don't have people coming in and um, you know maybe hearing some of the things that are said or even just the visual aspect. Some of you are working in your place of business, your office. So keeping that same level of HIPAA compliance that you would uh, in person is so very important. And I think it's important to really 
um, be clear on what's HIPAA compliant and what's not. Some of these platforms, they may offer great connection, but they're not necessarily HIPAA compliant in terms of safety and security. So search out that information and ensure what you're using is. I use Doxy.me and I also use Theranest for my um, my management system and I'm going to move to Theranest uh, after this month, but I've had great success with Doxy.me. There are many options out there, so whatever's working for you is good as long as it is HIPAA compliant and it's definitely safe and secure. That is a biggie. Now, one thing that you want to really make sure that you consider any risk such as ab reactions, disassociation, or um, safety and safety. So ab reaction is a highly distressing or disturbing event and that can happen right there when you're doing the EMDR therapy. So on this image here, I put a an empty space because a client can just walk away. We're not in that space with them physically, so we don't have the ability to walk and try to find them. Now, if you've ever had an ab reaction happen in person, you know it can be pretty alarming. It can be scary and it can leave you feeling not only inadequate, but really, you know, and um, just concerned for the client. But at least you can go after them. In the virtual world, you need to have contingencies in place. I used to, in the beginning of my work, have ab reactions, as many people have, every once in a while before I started really doing a, a solid phase two preparation in EMDR therapy. Once you do a solid phase two, I feel like it really lowers the probability, and I don't have any research to back this up, so this is definitely through my experience. I've noticed that once I beefed up my phase two preparation um, efforts and really got clear on what phase two was, that's when my ab reactions decrease. That's when my clients were actually prepared to work on the tough stuff. So that leads me to um, the later parts of this uh, webinar really talking about the importance of preparing our clients. All right, so it is super important to be very intentional with your work. You don't want to fly by the seat of your pants with this. Really know that there are eight phases of EMDR therapy. I know a lot of times people consider EMDR just phase four when they're doing that um, dual attention stimulation or that we used to call it bilateral stimulation and they would say well we finally got to EMDR. Well EMDR is eight phases and it's important that we not only know that there are eight phases but we know each of the eight phases in detail. So online working with our clients, especially during this time, knowing that many of the people may not have worked online with clients before this, I really recommend focusing on phase one and phase two and reaching out for support by an injury approved consultant um, to just get further guidance, maybe do some case consultation or to hone your skills. Someone that is familiar and experienced and um, just trained in working with children and adolescents is really important. And you can find a lot of just information on injury approved consultants and training options right there at that website that I recommended before, injuria.org, www.emdria.org. Um, you can find someone to work with. You can find a training to give you not only familiarization with all eight phases, but training on how to do all eight phases because you need to really know it regardless of whether you're working online or not. You need to know it in detail so that you can deliver EMDR therapy with fidelity. One thing that as child and teen therapists we need to keep in mind is the importance of parent consultation, of communicating with parents especially when we're working with them online. I feel like this is important because we want to have someone that we can 
connect to if there is an ab reaction. We need to um, be able to talk to them about uh, strategies and tips on how to support them in between sessions. We need to um, have their just information to help us create a good solid treatment plan. There's so many reasons to work with parents and caregivers. Now it is important to know that that confidentiality is essential and we need to keep that in place when we're working with children and adolescents. Now of course they do have the limited confidentiality if they you know um, are a harm to themselves or others then we need to reach out to someone that can support them more. When I'm working with parents I really go over just themes of their play and our treatment goals but not specifics of what they've said or done. If you do that, you're really violating the confidentiality and um, more so you're, you could um, make it to where the client actually doesn't trust the therapeutic process and there could be lots of things that spin off from that as well. So you want to keep that parent communication in, in place, but remember the confidentiality. Now, one thing that's important, and this is part of the phase two efforts preparation, is to be able to support our clients in between sessions, put a lot of resources in there that they can use when they start to um, get out of their window of tolerance, when things are stressful and when they need to calm. So one thing that I've been doing a lot lately is recommending some really good apps I like the Calm app. Um, sometimes clients already have some, as well as just teaching them some breathing techniques or journaling. Journaling is something that not all clients like, but those who do use it and they, um, it's something that they uh, prefer they find a lot of comfort and um, just de-escalation in between the sessions. So that may happen as well as just reaching out to their supports and connecting with their support system. So supporting our clients in between sessions is important, especially during this time. One thing that we need to consider, which I think sometimes, and this is just my personal opinion, is overlooked, the awareness of cultural and environmental considerations. Sometimes we tend to look at the world through our eyes, through our experiences, what we're used to, but many of our clients may live in a very different environment. They may have a lot of um, things in place in their life culturally, um, environmentally, it may be chaotic. There may be some things that in their culture are not the same as the culture that we have. So exploring their culture with them, and I do think that's part of phase one um, and phase two, but definitely phase one, really looking at those considerations is essential. Okay, so virtual delivery of EMDR by an EMDR trained clinician only is important. So having that basic training um, one and two is not optional. It it um, before you deliver EMDR therapy, you need to be EMDR trained. And I love the way that um, injury they're just very um, they they have a high standard and they make sure that the people that are trained in EMDR get good quality training and consultation. So basic training comes with it, lots of consultation so that when someone is delivering EMDR therapy, they are, um, they are doing it as it was researched, as it was designed. So being EMDR trained to deliver EMDR therapy is a must. Okay, how do we prepare our space for our online sessions? Well, one, definitely lock the door so someone doesn't come barging in on you. Um, if you um, want to have water next to you so that you don't need to get up during a session, I feel like that's important. And any supportive materials. I put a body scan and the My Battery papers there. These are things that I, I'll link to below. You can um, just click on the link and get them. You don't need any email address or anything. It'll just take you right there. And you can share your screen with the clients or you can email the files to them and they can print it out. I like sharing the screen because I don't want... 
um, my clients to feel like they have to print anything or or do anything like that also having any kind of art materials or any toys depending on the client that you're working with that's why it's really important to do a solid phase one history taking and just really knowing um, the client's situation can give you an idea of what works best for them okay so this is a biggie I want you to listen up there are a lot of opportunities out there for people to self-administer EMDR and it is not advised by Emdria. It can actually cause harm and some of these um, things that um, are available to people without an, a live EMDR trained clinician present is not um, a good idea. So do not encourage self-administration of EMDR therapy. If you want to learn more about that, definitely reach out to an EMDR approved consultant or go to um, EMDR.org and learn about um, just the just risk and how self-administration is um, not only not advised, it's um, definitely prohibited. Okay, so have a plan when you're working with your clients. Have a plan to do um, what to do in case of an emergency. Okay, if we lose power, we're going to do this. What is your parent's phone number, which I'm sure you'll already have that. Um, I really recommend printing out the demographic sheet out of your records management system, having your intake forms there, having all that information so that you have the address, you have the number. If you needed to call emergency services for a report, you um, have that information right there and you can get safety to them um, as much as possible. Now, as EMDR clinicians, Many of us work with um, clients that have experienced some intensive trauma, some complex trauma. So we may have clients that are at risk. They may have suicide ideation. They may have. They may be struggling with just um, real deep depression, um, anxiety, self-harming behaviors. Know your clients and really always err on the side of safety. Okay, so. Check in with your malpractice insurance for specifics on this, but these are some considerations that you really need to think about. Like, are the things that you're doing with your clients, are they ethical? Have you provided informed consent opportunities? Um, look at the legalities of it, the liability, your licensure requirements where in the state or the country that you're in. Really look at all those pieces to make sure that you are practicing um, in accordance to what you're supposed to, how you're supposed to be doing it. And I recommend definitely to learn about the brain. And this is so true, whether you're working with your clients online or in person, really being familiar with the brain and how it works and what your approaches to therapy are and how they impact the brain, looking at that bottom up versus top down with our clients especially clients that have experienced trauma, having that feeling of safety and security is a must. And you can really get that well with the bottom-up approach, so having that therapeutic presence, doing some of these um, play-based activities that help just calm the body, help the autonomic nervous system just dial down. So familiarizing yourself with bottom-up and top-down approaches is really important. Now, um, in the techniques that I'm going to show you in just a bit, I do include some bottom-up and top-down because once our clients are feeling safe and secure and we've worked thoroughly with them from that bottom-up embodied approach, then we have access to help them learn some things and to engage that higher-level thinking, that top part of the brain. Okay, so I really want you to visit, you know by now, the Andrea.org website. On that website, and I'll link this below, is Andrea's definition of EMDR. This is definitely, it won't take you that long to read. It's, um, it's so very important. You can look at the intention of each 
phase, what you you need to do in each phase, what each phase is, um, how it was designed, how it was researched. Really knowing the phases is kind of like, you know, when you're, um, you have a camera and you're putting it into focus, that is what occurs when you look at Andrea's definition. You really can get clear on, okay, this is what I do in phase one. This is what I do in phase two. This is what phase three looks like. Um, in my advanced training, eight phases of EMDR therapy with children and adolescents integrating play therapy techniques, I actually provide a checklist, which I'm going to show you a little bit of how I do that, but a checklist for each phase so that the clinician can look at it and say, okay, I did this, this, and this, and this. So you can read it before the session. You can read it after the session when you're writing your progress notes and really be clear on um, what you're doing when. That is important to work with intentionality. Okay, so here's another person that inspires me. I um, met her during the Innovative Child Therapy Symposium, and I was looking for an Imdria-approved clinician that was also, uh, or consultant, actually, um, that is also trained and experienced in the world of play therapy, and Alyssa Kalbach, Um was recommended to me and I'm so glad that I met her. She says so much time is spent on implementing EMDR and play therapy in the right way. No amount of training will help you to implement the two modalities effectively when your own negative beliefs about your ability to use EMDR and play therapy are activated. Your best initial asset in integrating EMDR and play therapy is gaining a strong understanding of the standard protocol through consultation and being solidified in your play therapy approaches and orientation. I love Alyssa's work and I feel like she is right on target there. When you truly understand EMDR as it was designed, as it was researched, uh, specifically Imdria, um, what they have to offer, that's when you can do some good solid work and you can integrate your play therapy techniques in there really well. Definitely visit this site. This is an image of Imdria.org. I literally look at this every few days, if not more, to look at any new information. I look at trainings. There's lots of great resources there. When I'm working with my certification groups, I um, share the screen. We look at the certification requirements, um, all kinds of great information there. And this is where you can find some trainings and you can just really get familiar with EMDRs uh, or Imdria's definition of EMDR. So if you see right up there, there's a little search bar. If some of the links below don't work for whatever reason, depending on when you're watching this video, if it's been moved around, you can just search for what you're looking for right there. Great resource. Okay, so let's look at phase one. What happens in phase one? Well, we need to use professional judgment to determine if EMDR is even suitable for the client. We need to determine if it's a good time for therapy, look at potential targets from negative events, prepare a treatment plan to include past, present, and future issues, that three-prong protocol that you learned about in basic training, identify positive and adaptive aspects of the client's life, Access, or assess the client if they have adequate affect regulation skills and resources to remain stable and explore any secondary gain issues that would limit their progress in therapy. That's a good solid phase one. You can definitely do that online in virtual therapy if you have all of those safety considerations in place, all what we just talked about. Now, what happens in phase two? We really need to discuss a framework of EMDR for informed consent with parent um, and the client, if appropriate, depending on age and developmental capacity. Ensure the therapeutic relationship is sufficient for the client's emotional safety. Assess and support the client's ability to engage in self-soothing and affect regulation. Assess and support adequate adaptive resources, and assess and support adequate affect regulation skills for development of positive and adaptive memory networks to expand the client's window of tolerance and development of capacity for relationship. That is a good solid phase too. Now if you heard anything in those two checklists that really you were like, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what an adaptive memory network is or 
I don't know what she's talking about, about the window of tolerance. Take those terms and look for training information, pursue consultation on those, because you really want to make sure the pieces that are in these definitions are carried through and followed through, and that's when you're going to do the best um, work with your clients. So know these definitions and um, use that to guide your work. Okay, so I totally didn't even realize that this slide looks like candy corn. But when I had my basic training, um, one of my basic trainers was um, Linda Ruff out of Orlando. And she is amazing. I love Linda. And she um, talked about we want to have a really good imbalance between um, the good stuff and the tough stuff. So we want to have way more good things then tough things before we proceed on with therapy with the client. So I've always kept this in mind on the importance of just building up the client's resources and resourcing every chance you get. So I'm going to share with you some online play therapy techniques at the time of this recording. Um, actually, tomorrow at the time of this recording on April 15th, 2020, have another free training coming out on play therapy techniques to support your uh, child and teen clients online. So if you know those two definitions, you know the whole definition of EMDR as defined by Imdria, then you can fit those in where it um, applies. So I'm going to tell you about my batteries, the body scan, play-based breath work, child-directed play, snacking with the senses, um, the 54321 grounding, just drawing a picture of it and strengthening the child parent relationship through play. And in the link below, you'll also see um, a place where you can access some of the um, forms that I created that go with that. So, the My Batteries, this is influenced by Dr. Matthew Munyon. It's actually something that I learned about when I was in grad school, and he, he called it the I Well. So, very good. Looking at the different areas of a a child's life um, and exploring kind of how charged is their school battery and um, it, it may sound like this and in the training that I have going on tomorrow there's actual video demonstrations of it I didn't put them in this training though because not only is it redundant but I, it would make this training much longer so um, the school battery a child may say well my school battery is charged 50 percent so you may say well, tell me about what's in that 50%. What could you, um, how could you put it on charge? What else does it need? So you can definitely use this as part of your phase one efforts of just really looking at that, um, exploring the child's world and creating that treatment planning at the different areas. I did leave a blank battery there because there may be something in that child's life, depending on like their cultural or environmental situation, something specific to that child that you can just write in. Again, this was... Um, uh, given let Dr. Matthew Munyon not only taught me about it and I adapted it to the work with kids, but um, he also gave me uh, permission to use this. And I used it in my 30 day play therapy technique challenge recently, where I shared 30 techniques, um, play therapy techniques. Thank you, Dr. Munyon. Okay, so body scan. This is a body scan that I had created after I realized that. Um, my clients, my child clients specifically, weren't really understanding um, my directive of scan your body, notice any tight, any tense, any unusual sensations. So I had a graphic designer create this to really give them that like kid-friendly version of it, and this works really well. So I just explore the different body sensations. We listen, or we, we read that listening to my body book, which is so very good. Um, and just explore the different, um, just somatic um, sensations in the body. So good. This is also linked below. If you notice, I have some positive cognitions in the background because when I'm working with children, really with any of my clients, um, kind of based on that concept of we want way more good things and tough things, anytime there is an opportunity to resource something, the client may... Um, tell a story or may describe something where there was some strength or where they had choices or where they were trustworthy or where they're safe or they deserve love, 
all of that um, you can resource it you can use if I like to use the phrase notice that and just really build up all those good things it's great for phase two so play based breath work I love um, having kids just learn playful ways to really breathe and when we can breathe in a therapeutic way and really kind of calm down that parasympathetic response system it can help a client de-escalate not only when they're with us in session but it helps them to be able to have that affect regulation that's described in the phase two definition now I put an elephant over there to the left because I um, I like to use I call it elephant breathing. If you have a more creative way to describe it, I would love <laughs> I would love to uh, hear it. But I have them pretend their arm is a trunk, and then they lift it up and they look up with um, their eyes up at the trunk and get that good vertical eye movement. And they breathe in as they go up through their nose, and they breathe out through their mouth. One of my common directives is um, uh, smell the flower, blow out the candle. And I love to incorporate the eye movements in these play-based breath work techniques with my MDR clients as much as possible because when we can kind of um, make it more robust, we see the de-escalation to um, just happen more rapidly. Okay, just child-directed play. We talked about that a bottom-up approach just really being present with the child when they are playing with their toys and we're tracking them. They're like, oh, you have that there. Oh, you put that together. Wow, look at that. Oh, that's on top of that. Oh, you decided to take that off. Just tracking um, uh, content and feeling and all of those things that if you work with children and adolescents, you may or may not have been trained in play therapy training. If you are looking for for some good play therapy training opportunities I definitely recommend the Association for Play Therapy it has a lot of great opportunities um, to learn I have um, some trainings uh, many uh, I, I say go to that Association for Play Therapy um, website and you can find some just really looking at some ways to work with children and adolescents this child directed play and this bottom-up approach is one of the most powerful ways to help a child feel safe and secure and to be able to just calm down their autonomic nervous system so when they're working through the later phases of the MDR therapy, they are um, solidly prepared. Okay, snacking with the senses. I like this when He has a white cheddar cheese. It's, I did little screenshots from my training that I'm going to... Um, do tomorrow from these demonstrations these are all actors and actresses I wouldn't even um, think of putting my clients information out publicly like this but he's doing this exercise this activity with his senses with these white cheddar cheeses so tell me about um, what do you see on it what do you smell put in your mouth what do you taste as you as you chomp down on it what do you hear what do you feel so really getting a tune with these snacks is cool the um the apple there i have over the years which is interesting i've had people come in with apples in session and since i've been doing this online therapy um they have had apples with them as well. Now, I have went through the entirety of all eight phases of EMDR therapy with children and adolescents and adults online, but it's done with great, um, you know, I'm, I'm really thinking it through. It is a well-established client. I um, really tend to kind of go back to target more frequently, maybe EMDR, EMD little r, but for the purposes of this training staying in phase one and phase two is what I'm recommending all right so grounding with the senses just having them what are five things that you see what are four things that you can hear five things or um well, I have five on every one of those that's interesting <laughs> name five things you could see four things that you can hear Three things you can touch, two things you can smell, and one thing that you like to taste. So that's the five, four, three, two, one. She's showing me some flour there. Super fun, super playful. It has that just that play-based feel to it, which is really important when working with children and adolescents. 
draw a picture of it. This is something that is so seemingly simple, but it is so robust in what you can do with it. So she's telling me a story about how it just doesn't seem fair that she has to clean up the room after her sisters mess it up. What's the worst part of that? Can you draw a picture of it? Ooh, that's so good. That definitely helps to prepare us for the later phases of EMDR therapy. You know, you may think that, um, you know, wow, that looks like it may be part of phase three assessment. But really knowing that, you know, in phase one, we're looking at potential targets as well. So drawing a picture of it, having them hold it up to the screen and showing you is helpful. This is my very favorite, strengthening the child-parent relationship through play. Play is so very good. Now, if you haven't read um, Mona Della Hook's Beyond Behavior book yet, I definitely recommend, and also aggressive Aggression and Play Therapy book by Lisa Dion. That Beyond um, Behaviors book, she really talks about the power of play and how just little simple games like hide and seek, and you'll see in my training tomorrow if you watch it, um, where just playing hide and seek, she runs behind the curtain. She's so cute. She's three years old. And um, that hide and seek, look how much attunement, how much connection, safety, and security. The um, impulse control of just like holding back giggles and being quiet, being patient, all kinds of good stuff can occur through play, especially knowing the importance of that child-parent relationship. I was trained years ago in child-parent relationship therapy. Oh my goodness, that's such a great type of train um, therapy. Um, I was trained at University of Central Florida by Dr. Delina Taylor, but there's all, um, lots of training. There's a great uh, workbook you can find online. Just Google child-parent relationship therapy training. Um, a, or go to that uh, Association for Play Therapy website to get information. That training not only helps me to support my parents in connecting, also therapy is a great type of therapy as well. There's so many good types of uh, trainings out there. But um, it helps you to just really consult with the parent with some strategies and some tips to help them through their tough stuff. Mm -hmm.